Welcome, my dear viewers, thank you for being with my channel and watching my videos, I'm telling you a story from my life, watch this video to the end, you will understand what I'm telling you, so as not to miss my new videos, do not forget to subscribe to the channel and leave your explanations in the comments then let's go. He insulted me, saying I don't want a kid like you, he smirked. I was shocked to see my dad laughing in a teasing way. Sorry but I won't be taking care of you. You're in high school now, you can manage on your own, right? He added, I'm running off with my lover, so don't try to contact me again. Right after my mom's passing, my dad skipped her funeral and revealed he was running away with his girlfriend. I was deeply disappointed with him and I didn't feel like stopping him. Go ahead, I won't reach out to you, thanks. He left the house, saying, I'm fortunate to have an understanding daughter like you. I believed we'd never cross paths again. Despite what a lousy father he was, I felt almost relieved to be free of him. Surprisingly, just three days later, I received a relentless call from him. I considered ignoring it but chose to pick up. Who is this? Then my father on the other end of the line said something unbelievable. My name is Emily Young a fresh high school student. You might think I'm enjoying the typical high school life, but my home situation is far from ideal, all because of my father. He was a well-educated, leading accountant, often the subject of envy. However, his true character wasn't admirable. He had a habit of looking down on those with less education, including my mother, who only finished high school. He frequently belittled her, saying, a high school diploma is embarrassing. Without me, you couldn't survive in front of me. Despite what he said, she struggled to be financially independent and couldn't divorce him. She always encouraged me to study hard, emphasizing the importance of getting qualifications for financial independence. Don't end up like me, earn your own living, she'd say, reading books to me since my childhood. Even though my father earned well, he provided only the bare minimum and my mother couldn't afford to buy books for me. So, she often took me to the library, where she would read to me. Thanks to that, I got into a prestigious private school. However, my high-achieving father wasn't proud of me at all. He had no interest in me, not even knowing which high school I attended. His disinterest stemmed from archaic views of male superiority. Once he learned I was a girl, he lost interest. He had initially wanted a son to inherit his accounting firm, but that dream ended when my mother gave birth to me and couldn't have more children. Since then, he hardly showed any interest in my mother or me. When he was drunk, he'd insult my mother, saying, Damn, I'm such a nice guy to marry an ugly, stupid woman like you. She asked him to stop, especially in front of me. But he'd get furious, yelling, What, talking back to me? Do you realize who's feeding you, you useless woman? I couldn't bear to watch, locking myself in my room and covering my ears. His tyranny extended beyond verbal abuse. He also had a troubling habit of infidelity. Using work as an excuse, he frequently arrived home late, sometimes not until morning. Over time, he started emanating the scent of women's perfume, which repulsed me. I'd remark, your perfume is too strong pinching my nose. He'd respond with disdain, saying, What? You think your nose is too good? Why did he wear perfume too? A woman like you can't survive without relying on a man. I harbored deep resentment toward my father for uttering such demeaning remarks to his own daughter. However, it seemed like he didn't even realize the extent of my disdain. He'd continue with comments like, you do take after your mom with that plain face and personality. What's the use of a girl like you studying? You'll just end up a woman with too much pride, and no man will come near you. While he consistently insulted my mother for lacking education, he belittled me for being educated, claiming it was pointless for a woman to study. I considered this man truly hopeless. Adding to the frustration, he scarcely provided us with any money, he adorned himself in expensive brand suits and watches. Even his loungewear was stylish, leading me to question the economic inequality within our own home. 
when I proposed to my father, if you have that much money, why don't you buy something from mom? He nearly snorted, saying, it's my hard-earned money. What's wrong with spending it on myself? He adamantly refused to spend a penny on us. It was solely because of my mother that I could endure those days. However, just as I entered high school, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. By the time we discovered it, it was too late and she had a limited time left. Upon learning about it, I broke down, clinging to her and crying. I questioned, what am I going to do without you, mom? But then, considering the situation, I didn't want to cause her any more worry because of me. Since then, I made an effort to spend the remaining time with her as joyfully as possible. When I visited her in the hospital, she would say, Sorry for troubling you every day, Emily. You have schoolwork too. You don't need to visit me so often, with a relatively cheerful smile. I responded, I come because I want to see you, Mom. Plus, staying at home means dealing with that drunken father of mine. I can't stand even looking at him. Hearing this, my mother's expression turned a bit sad. I'm sorry for making you feel that way about your father. I'd always hoped you and your dad would get along. Irritated, I replied, I'm sorry, Mom, but that's impossible. You do all the housework and take care of me, and he just looks down on you for it. My mother sighed slightly and said, That's because I'm of no use in society. Trying to reassure her, I said, That's not true, Mom, but she just gave a faint, sad smile. My father never visited my mother in the hospital. He rarely came home either. On the few occasions I did see him at home, I asked him to visit mom, but he refused. I'm busy with work. You, her daughter, should visit her. Dan, her suddenly getting sick and leaving all the housework undone is such a nuisance. Horrified. I responded, how could you talk like that? Can't you at least worry about mom a little? He replied with disgust, saying, Worry? I'm more concerned about my own future. She promised to take care of me for life, and now she gets sick so soon. It's unbelievable. I couldn't suppress my anger and shot him a glare. What's with that look? You do realize you're living off me, right? I wanted to leave this house, but frustratingly, he was correct. I was still a freshman in high school and under his roof. Then... A month later, my mother passed away. Amidst the grief, I busied myself with preparing for her funeral. My father insisted we didn't need to have a funeral and provided no help. However, I was determined to give my mother a modest farewell. I called him, mentioning his busy work schedule and infrequent returns home. Hey, I decided to hold a funeral for mom, so please come. When did I stop referring to him as dad? That thought crossed my mind, but I had no intention of using that term ever again. Annoyed, he replied, Dan, I told you we don't need a funeral. I'm not going to spend any money on that, you know. I'll work and pay you back in the future, so please at least come to the funeral. I'm busy that day, plus I hate such pathetic events like funerals, he said before hanging up abruptly. I was left speechless. Despite our strained relationship, he had been married to her for years, yet he wouldn't be there for her final moments or even attend her funeral. This was the breaking point for me. I lost all respect for my father. The next day, an unusual event occurred. I thought it was rare for my father to be home, but there he was in the living room with a large suitcase. Seeing my puzzled expression, he blurted out, I don't need a brat like you, sneering. I was stunned to witness my father laughing mockingly. Sorry, but I'm not going to look after you. You're in high school. You can live on your own, right? I'm eloping with my lover. So don't ever contact me again. Immediately after my mom's death, without attending her funeral, my father declared his elopement with his mistress. I was completely disillusioned with him and had no intention of trying to stop him. Just do whatever you want. I won't be reaching out to you, that's for sure. Thanks. I consider myself fortunate to have such an understanding daughter, he said before leaving the house. I believe that was the last encounter between us. Strangely, despite how awful he was as a father, 
I felt oddly relieved to be free of him. However, just three days later, I received a persistent call from him. Initially contemplating ignoring it, I eventually decided to answer. Who is this? Startled by my response, he stammered you. How can you ask who is this to your own father? I retorted sharply. Do you really think I still see you as my father? Are you foolish? This seemed to fluster him even more. Hey, you've done something terrible, you know. Because of you, I might lose my job. What are you talking about? I haven't done anything. Weren't you the one who said never to contact you again? I replied casually. Then, at the height of his anger, he shouted over the phone. Is this really the time for that? I know what you're doing. Listening to him seething in anger, I couldn't help but laugh. Yes, he was right. The predicament he found himself in was a result of my actions. This takes us back to before my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. Frustrated with my father's constant infidelity, I decided to gather evidence of his affairs by snooping through his phone. When he was intoxicated, he often carelessly left his phone unlocked, walked away, and dozed off. Swiftly taking his phone from his hand, I began sifting through the photos. There they were, numerous pictures of my father with a woman who appeared to be his mistress. I saved those photos to my phone. I embarked on a mission to uncover the identity of my father's mistress. However, being a high school student, my resources were limited. In contemplation, a close friend mentioned, you know, my friend's cousin is a private detective. I pleaded with the friend to introduce me to the detective who agreed to investigate my father's mistress, saying, okay, I'll do it for my cousin's sake and you can pay me later. The investigation yielded intriguing results. The mistress, Natalie Grubb, was supposedly 32 years old, residing alone in a luxurious condo. But this condo is too big for one person, pondered the detective. Delving deeper, he discovered that Natalie had a husband on an overseas assignment. My father, under the impression that Natalie was single, was in for a rude awakening. Upon learning this, I couldn't help but laugh. On the day my father abandoned me and left the house, I sent photos of his affair with Natalie to her overseas husband. Half of the photos were taken from my father's phone, and the rest were captured by the detective. Presumably, a furious call from Natalie's husband reached my father, and I could hear his agitated voice on the phone. Accompanying the photos sent to Natalie's husband was a letter stating, Your wife is having an affair with my dad, and you knew about it, didn't you? Yeah, you heard right. Well, it can't be helped. Yes, I did it, but so what? I just told the truth, I responded, leaving him speechless and trembling with anger. Adding insult to injury, I remarked, planning to elope without even knowing she was married? That's just stupid, further fueling his fury. What do you mean stupid? Talking to your parent like that? What you did is not just telling a husband about his wife's affair. It's more serious than that, he solemnly stated. Intrigued, I asked in a puzzled tone, what? What do you mean? That's the problem. You don't understand the gravity of the situation. My father continued, his voice trembling. Natalie's husband, he was an important executive at a major client of my company. No way, really. I exclaimed in surprise, though I already knew. Unaware of this revelation, my father lamented in a dark tone, all unfinished. How did it come to this? The detective's investigation had unveiled that Natalie's husband was an executive at S Corporation, a publicly listed company and a key client of my father's firm. Upon discovering that S Corp was a major client of my father's company, a thrilling sense of excitement surged within me. This presented an opportunity for revenge for my mother. Yesterday, Natalie's husband stormed into the office, spreading a fair photos of me and Natalie throughout the company. Stunned, I momentarily froze but coolly remarked, serves you right. Quiet. You have no idea how much contempt I face from my employees. Me, the president, being ridiculed by those lower-level employees. It's humiliating. I couldn't suppress a laugh at his words. My father, 
always proud and condescending, was now scorned by his own employees. The irony was palpable. Soon, the president of Escort contacted us, announcing the termination of their business relationship. Wow, that's serious. You really don't get it, do you? It's not just that. After Escort pulled out, all my employees submitted their resignations. His words left me in shock. Everyone, why would they do that? Because without S-Corp, my company is finished. Is that so? My father's accounting firm, a small office with about five employees, relied heavily on revenue from his corp Frustrated with my father's tyranny, the employees likely decided to leave en masse once S-Corp withdrew. Although surprised at the extent of the situation, it felt like just desserts given my father's actions. Natalie had left him, his employees were gone, and my father was now utterly alone. Despite his previous indifference to my mother and me, it turned out he was vulnerable to loneliness, which probably explained his repeated infidelity. Suddenly feeling lonely, he made an outrageous proposition. Well, it's fine. I was thinking of coming back home anyway. What do you mean? Well, I've broken up with Natalie, and I'm not alone now. I thought I'd come live with you. His audacious suggestion disgusted me. How could he have the audacity to return now? Living together harmoniously was impossible after everything. There's no way I'm living with you. I don't want to live with you at all. I flatly rejected his proposal. Unmindful of my disdain, he clung to the idea. Don't be so stubborn. You're still in high school, aren't you? Still a child. You should want to live with your parent, right? His statement was audacious, especially after claiming I could live on my own because I was in high school. How can he shamelessly say such a thing? Unfortunately for you, I can live just fine without you. In fact, my life would be a mess with you around. So don't you dare come back, I declared, and he grew angry. What are you talking about? That house you're living in is my house. It's only natural for me to return. No matter what you say, I'm definitely coming back. Faced with this reality, I had no choice but to concede. That's true. This house is in my father's name. So, I don't have the right to refuse him. That's true. I reluctantly conceded. Upon hearing my resigned response, he sounded relieved. Right. So from now on, Let's live together as a family, just you and me. In response to his cheerful suggestion, I coldly retorted, no, it's fine. I'll be leaving. What? What do you mean? Where are you planning to go? My father asked, surprised. I'm going to my grandparents' house in Nebraska, living with you. No thanks. It's my mom's parents' place. Anticipating my father's potential return to this house after learning about Natalie being married, I had already contacted my maternal grandparents in Nebraska as a precaution. They readily agreed to take me in. My father's parents, much like him, were selfish and unmanageable, so I barely kept in touch with them. Hearing this, my father sounded troubled. Don't say that. We're the only family we have. I'll change my ways. Let's live together, he insisted. But I said, I know what you're up to. You just want me to take care of you, right? You're just worried about being alone and dying alone? I accused him. No, that's not true. Look, you said you want to go to college, right? I'll pay for it. If you don't live with me, I won't pay. Are you okay with that? Faced with his intimidation over the phone, I replied simply, I'm fine with it. What? Don't be so stubborn. Planning to work part-time while attending college. It's hard, you know. Just give up on that idea. As usual, my father belittled me. But I informed him, I have the life insurance money that mom left me. He sounded completely taken aback. Life insurance? You mean she had a policy? Yes, yes. After my mother passed away, she had made sure I wouldn't struggle financially by taking out a life insurance policy. She had become ill after giving birth to me, and that's when she started worrying about what would happen to me if she fell ill again and left me alone. 
My father had no interest in me since then, and his infidelity was rampant. She was worried that after she was gone, he wouldn't provide me with enough money for college or even basic living expenses. So she managed with the meager allowance my father gave and did some work from home without him knowing, just so she could pay for the insurance. Wait a minute. Where did the money for that insurance premium come from? She was just a housewife, right? So does that mean she used my money to pay for it? My father, stingy as ever, questioned. If she took out insurance with my money, then I should get the payout, right? I couldn't believe he'd think there's a law for that. But I told him, no, you're wrong. Mom was working from home while being a housewife. She used that money for the insurance. What? My father, who had lived as he pleased, didn't want my mother working outside and never allowed her to even have a part-time job. So she chose work she could do from home and earned a small income without him knowing. Hearing this, he muttered, I've been deceived. She was doing all that behind my back. I couldn't hold back my anger at his words, deceived. Really? Can you believe it? She struggled so much because you only gave her the bare minimum to live on. All my clothes were bought from auction sites. I never got new clothes. I don't think she ever spent money on herself. He was silent, unable to make a sound. And yet, you are out there splurging on brand name goods and luxury items, enjoying life alone. You're the worst. But I had to spend on my appearance for work. Those extravagances you're talking about, they were for entertaining clients, he tried to justify. But I wasn't fooled. Sure, there were some client entertainments. But I also knew about the trips and lavish meals he enjoyed with his mistresses, while never giving a single gift to my mother or me. Recalling all this thoroughly disgusted, I said, That's enough. I've lived with you for over a decade. I know what kind of person you are. Sorry. But don't ever contact me again, I said sharply. Despite my father raising his voice, saying, Wait. I didn't care and hung up the phone. Following that, it appears my father's company faced rapid bankruptcy. He had been misusing the company's funds for personal gain, relying on revenue from S Corporation. Once the ties with S Corporation were severed, his company swiftly crumbled financially and declared bankruptcy. Post-bankruptcy, job opportunities eluded my father and his income plummeted. The industry quickly caught wind of rumors about his affair with the wife of an executive at S Corporation, severely damaging his reputation. Despite his pride, my father, unable to offer apologies, struggled in sales and found himself adrift. Eventually, he couldn't meet mortgage payments and had to relinquish the house. Turning to his own parents for assistance proved futile as they rejected their selfish son. Disowning him, they declared, He's no longer our son. Socially and financially ruined, having lost home, family, and mistress, my father now lives on the streets. Unaccustomed to failure, he appears mentally fragile and incapable of reintegrating into society. On my part, after my mother's memorial service, I relocated to Nebraska to live with my grandmother, gradually settling into a more stable life. Much like my mother, my grandmother is kind and an excellent cook, providing me with a more comfortable life than my time at my parents' house. During my days off, I visit my mother's grave with my grandmother, savoring Mont Blanc's cake, her favorite. On our way home, my high school life is thriving, and I'm enjoying happy days with friends, attempting to compensate for the challenging times I've faced. Yet there are occasions when I miss my mother and find myself shedding tears. Although I believed my grandmother and others were oblivious, it turns out they cared. One day, to my surprise, she brought home a puppy, stating, I thought it might help ease your loneliness a bit, Emily. You said you love toy poodles, right? Yes, I love them. Having a dog has always been my dream, I replied. And my grandmother beamed warmly, enchanted by the puppy's enthusiastic tail wagging and affectionate licks, I resolved to gradually increase my happiness in this way.